All right. Um, welcome everyone to this month's version of University Round and uh, our very special Harlan Smith lecture. Uh, this is an annual lecture that is founded by, organized by, and hosted by the members of the Division of Anatomy and their chair, Cindy Morissette, who's here with us this morning and uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about the founding of the Harlan Smith Lecture in a few minutes. It's great to have you all here, and I'd like to just remind you about Galley Day, which is Friday, May 5th, coming up soon, our uh, premier academic day at the Department of Surgery in the University of Toronto, um, where you're going to have an opportunity to hear from all our young scientists and learners uh, tell us about their exciting work. Uh, the visiting professor for Galley Day is Alan Lumsden, who's the chair of cardiovascular surgery at the DeBakey Heart and Vascular Institute and Houston Methodist. Uh, he's gonna be talking about digital visualization and how it's revolutionizing surgical care. And uh, tied in with that, we have a symposium on AI and surgery. Um, so please mark that in your calendar. It's back at the Mars Auditorium, beautiful facility. And that's Friday, May 5th, with the Galley Day dinner to follow. Um, next, I'd like to acknowledge the land upon which the University of Toronto operates. We're very grateful to have the opportunity and the honor to work and gather and communicate on this land, which for thousands of years was the homeland to many different Indigenous peoples including the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And it's still the home to many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. And we who are non-Indigenous strive to enter into a better relationship with our Indigenous colleagues, friends, and patients, as well as a better relationship with the land. Now uh, to the Harlan Smith Lecture. I mentioned that this is hosted by the Division of Anatomy. And just to remind you, the Division of Anatomy is one of nine divisions in the Department of Surgery, along with orthopedics, plastics, urology, general surgery, cardiac, vascular, thoracic, and neurosurgery. And we were just saying how fitting it is to remember that anatomy is so foundational uh, to our understanding of what it means to be a surgeon and how fitting it is that anatomy is housed within our department. Uh, we're really glad that this uh, came to pass during the Resnick era and that it continues. And we have a very good relationship with uh, Dr. Morrishead and her division members. So without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Cindy Morrishead. Thank Thanks, you. Cindy. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share this screen so everyone can see this. This is uh, Dr. Carlton Smith and his wife, Rita Harlan, uh, which it, to, who sponsored this lectureship. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the University Rounds. <clears throat> the lectureship was endowed by both Dr. Carlton Smith, primarily in honor of his wife, Rita Harlan. Both Carlton and Rita were professors in the Department of Anatomy for many years. They've shared a very deep commitment to the University of Toronto, as well as to its students. Uh, when the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology was then incorporated into the Department of Surgery as the Division of Anatomy, Dr. Smith donated funds that would endow this lectureship, which is dedicated to surgeons whose career has an emphasis on the integration of anatomic knowledge into surgical practice. So I'd like to thank Dr. Terry Yao from the Division of Cardiac Surgery for organizing this year's rounds and to invite him now to introduce this morning's speaker. Stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Cindy. And good morning to everybody. So I'm very pleased to introduce this year's 2023 Hart and Smith lecturer, Professor Tom Wynn. Um, so Tom actually went to medical school at Hopkins and we were chatting about that before. 
and then his general surgery training at Stanford, cardiothoracic surgery at Columbia, and then he did a fellowship in transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, at Emory. And he's currently the professor and chief of the Division of Adult Cardiothoracic Surgery at the University of California at San Francisco. And Tom's particular interests are in minimally invasive mitral and aortic valvular surgery, minimally invasive closures of atrial septal defects, and septal myectomies for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, as well as robotic heart surgery. In addition to that uh, uh, wide panoply of expertise, he's also an expert in transcatheter procedures, including TAVR aortic valve replacements and mitral clip procedures for mitral regurgitation. And he's actually performed more than 2,400 implants, so truly really a staggering uh, uh, amount of expertise there. So Tom, thanks very much for joining us. Like, you know, I know it is an ungodly hour on the West Coast, even for our cardiac <laughs> surgeon, uh, but we're very much looking forward to our 2023 Harlan Smith Lecture. Uh, which is entitled Anatomy, Anatomy is Everything, uh, Understanding the Simply Complicated Mitral Valve. So Tom, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yao, Dr. Swallow, Dr. Morsehead, distinguished faculty and guests, uh, for the opportunity to present uh, on one of my passions, the anatomy and nature's design of the mitral valve. Uh, I apologize for not being able to be there in person. Um, I also wanted to personally recognize, also personally recognize Dr. Carlton Smith and Dr. Rita Harlan uh, for their contributions to the field of anatomy and their endowment to make this lecture possible. There are a lot of similarities between the University of Toronto and UCSF. Uh, both are big metropolitan cities, both have strong commitments to research uh, and to ed education. But what really speaks to my heart uh, is that despite being one of the oldest institutions in North America, they're both one of the most progressive and innovative with a firm commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion led by prominent leaders in our field at the University of Toronto, Dr. Carol Swallow, and at UCSF, Dr. Julianne Sosa. And this reflected really by the all-star faculty, as you can see here, as well as many others who uh, build the Department of Surgery at University of Toronto. And when I look at something a little more close to home to me, when I look at the picture of the Department of Cardiac Surgery, I, I see a lot of friends, pioneers, innovators, uh, master surgeons, role models, and it really is a true honor to present here in front of you, uh, including Dr. Terry Yao, thank you for the kind invitation. Um, Dr. Tyrone David, who's a true legend in our field. There are a few surgeons who have really been as inspirational as Dr. David, and, and it really is a privilege to, to talk about the mitral valve in front of someone who really helped, uh, helped us understand, helped me understand valvular heart disease. Uh, Moral, Bobby, Mark, Steven, uh, Robert, Perus. Uh, to name a few. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to, to present this morning. The title of my talk uh, is The Simply Complicated Mitral Valve. And, and in some ways, when we think of, about the mitral valve, it seems like just another simple valve that opens and closes. But the more we, I learn about the valve, the more we realize how, we're, how much we really, really don't know. So the goal of my talk uh, will include really just two things. One, to explore nature's design of the mitral valve and kind of focus on, on anatomy. And two, uh, try to develop some clinical relevance to, to what we know anatomically about the mitral valve and what we do as, uh, as surgeons. As a background, uh, I spent probably over 20 years trying to better understand the mitral valve. This is me circa 2002 when I was a research resident in Craig's, Craig Miller's lab uh, at Stanford. And what we would do is we would put fiduciary radiopaque markers around the mitral annulus to really better understand the mitral valve annular dynamics. And in this picture, we're studying pure volume overload and place a hole in the anterior mitral leaflet. And if you look carefully, uh, you'll see these small stainless steel markers switch around the mitral annulus. Uh, what we could do from here is we could track each of those fiduciary markers uh, through time and space and do a lot of neat uh, analysis on them. And this is a, a real animation of the markers throughout the cardiac cycle for us to better really understand uh, mitral annular dynamics. And that's something that um, I try to, try to focus on uh, when I was in Craig Miller's lab well, 20 plus years ago when I was a general surgery resident. In the next series of slides, uh, we're gonna try to build the mitral valve from the ground up. Um, and in thinking about nature's design of the mitral valve, I think it's important to understand why the heart was designed the way it was. And something, that the heart designs we can pro procreate, but ultimately the heart was really designed, I think, for us to escape from putters or catch prey. I guess you can imagine it's hard to procreate when you're in the need for lunch. So, uh, so I think 
being survival is probably uh, uh, kind of foremost in our uh, in our natural evolution. From a, a, na a nature's design standpoint, it's easier to design a heart if we're relatively mobile, but we're not. But on occasion, we know that we have and we need this huge burst of cardiac output to run and escape from predators or catch prey. But there are two two problems uh, with this, uh, and uh, that that needs to be overcome uh, for us to effectively run and, and get away from predators and and run and catch prey. The first problem is that oxygen is not a very diffusible molecule. And there are times uh, when our bodies have huge requirements for oxygen transfer to meet our oxygen demands. Uh, to meet our oxygen demands, our, our pulmonary membranes need to be thin with a high surface area. There needs to be a transpulmonary gradient uh, that has to be low to really kind of maximize diffusion. And the transpulmonary pressure needs to be low. But then this creates another problem. Then how do we fill the heart at a low pressure and then generate enough of a high pressure so that we could run away from predators? And, and you all know this and are reminded from medical school and, and from anatomy class, but the, the pressure when the blood eventually gets to the left atrium is relatively low. It's a low pressure system. The mean pressure in the left atrium is four to 12 millimeters of mercury. And it gets to the left ventricle and it increases, eventually it goes to the, the whole body where it gets a pressure that's a little bit more meaningful uh, for, um, for our body. So how, how do we fill the heart? And this is kind of, the, I think the core question, how do we fill the heart at a low pressure and then generate enough of a high pressure so we can run away from, uh, from predators? And as you can imagine, uh, the answer to this is anatomy and, and anatomy uh, is really everything. Um, and I'm gonna try to attempt to explain by building the heart from the ground up, how anatomically we're able to do this. But to do this, I think there are three concepts to really fully understand and help answer the, the question. The first concept is that the aortic valve and the left ventricle need to be, uh, to be circular. If you apply a force to something that's flexible, let's, uh, whatever that, that shape is, a circular shape will most evenly distribute the force across that, that body. And, and we know this, right? You know, that's why pipes are round and circular. You don't see square or hexagonal pipes. And our body knows this too. That's why every blood vessel in our body is circular. And as we know here, as a surgeon, uh, that's why the left ventricle is a very near perfect circular structure. The aortic valve also experiences a strong force, and as you can imagine, is also very circular. And I know that this sounds really basic. Uh, it's like, duh, yeah, it's circular. But, but I think it'll explain a little bit downstream uh, why things were designed the way it was. Nature could have designed the aortic valve in a left ventricle in pretty much any shape, but this design, they purposely designed it, she purposely designed it to be circular. And, and I think uh, it would have been very, very awkward if the aortic valve was, I don't know, a square or a hexagon. I, you know, if the aortic valve is a square, then eventually the aorta would have to be a square, and then maybe all the vessels uh, subsequently would have to be a square. The second really important concept, uh, I, I think, to understand is um, the, the concept, the concept of maximization of, of surface area. The remaining structure, once you have the aortic valve in the left ventricle, is surprisingly not a circle. And why, why, did, not, why did nature not designed the inflow to simulate to be like the aortic valve, to be a circle or maybe even a square. Uh, why is that? Uh, and I think the answer is, goes back to our core question, uh, to really effectively run away from predators and catch prey, we need to absolutely maximize the inflow area. And as you can see here, the shape, this shape here that takes full advantage of every square millimeter of that inflow area, is this funny looking shape that you see here. And we need a solution that ultimately allows the heart to fill from a very low pressure system into the left atrium, again, roughly at a mean pressure of four to 10 millimeters of mercury, then inject blood to the rest of the body at a mean uh, uh, pressure of roughly 60 to 90 millimeters, uh, millimeters of mercury. And, and what's amazing about this, and, and we kind of take it for granted, all this happens within fractions of a second. Uh, which is which is pretty impressive. Uh, again, this is anatomy talking and, and nature's design that's that's really doing this. The last and, and third concept that I think is actually really really cool is that the mitral valve is very dynamic and it's not a static structure. Right? Throughout the cardiac cycle, you can expect the mitral valve to expand by up to thirty percent. 
And you know, a lot of times, even in clinic, I'll I'll, I'll describe the mitral valve like a, or valves in general like a door that open open and closes. But but it's not like that at all. It actually is this dynamic door that opens and closes very efficiently. And 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 the way I kind of visualize it, and I'll have a, a video in a second. It's more like kind of a, a fish, a fish's mouth, kind of gulping in water uh, while they're trying to eat or trying to trying to obtain um, uh, prey. The mitral valve is uh, incredibly complex, uh, and uh, and we'll see here. This is an animation of the mitral valve uh, from the left atrial surgeon's view. And as you can see, the valve is very dynamic. You see the posterior annulus uh, actually uh, has an excursion posteriorly. The anterior annulus is relatively fixed because of the fibrous skeleton. Uh, but a, a lot of times, I don't think we fully appreciate how dynamic the mitral annulus is to really facilitate and kind of address those two problems that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> How do we run away from prey? How do we address the, the low uh, diffusion capacity of oxygen? And then how do we generate, go from a transition from a low pressure system to a high pressure system uh, in such a, a short a, amount of time? And this uh, video here really kind of shows, you know, uh, the fish's mouth. You can see it, it isn't really static. It, it's small and then eventually it just swallows water in and it comes back down. It's small, it swallows water in. And that's what our, our, our mitral valve is doing uh, billions of times throughout the cardiac cycle. So now that we, we know the, the ideal 2D shape of the mitral valve, what's the ideal 3D shape of the mitral valve? And it's important to also remember that the mitral valve is the only high pressure closing valve that is paper thin and expected to reliably open and close 3 billion times in our lifetime. And to understand the 3D shape of the mitral valve, I think it's really important um, to surprisingly talk about potato chips. Uh, have you ever wondered why Pringles chips, Pringles potato chips, if you eat Pringles, are really shaped unlike any other potato chip? Um, and the answer to this is in, in 1956, Procter & Gamble assigned a chemist, uh, his name was Frederick Bauer, to develop a new potato chip to address consumer complaints about broken chips coming to their, their front door and, and what do you do with a, a bag of just broken and crumbled uh, chips? So, so they assigned this chemist to go out there and try to build a, ship, uh, a chip shape that would be more durable and not crack during uh, transport. Well, you can imagine in parallel, how do you design a structure, an anatomic structure that can reliably open and close throughout through a pressure cycle of zero to 120 millimeters of mercury three billion times in a lifetime. And what Procter & Gamble realized is that a hyperbolic paraboloid is the most efficient structure to prevent lines of stress, but be surprisingly strong. So this is a very thin structure that's incredibly strong. And this shape allows Pringles to eventually travel to consumers and the ability to withstand forces uh, and not break once they get to your front door or your front office. And hopefully the next time you all have Pringles chips, uh, you'll think of the mitral valve. This also gives flavor to why um, designing valves, transcatheter valves, bioprosthetic valves is so complicated. And, and, and when companies try to develop a mitral valve, in my bias, I think it's, it's infinitely harder. And I'll, I'll go into this a little bit than the aortic valve. Uh, and, 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 and perhaps that's why the evolution of mitral valve has not been as expeditious as uh, the evolution of uh, aortic valve uh, technologies. And most of, the, of us think the mitral valve is flat, but, but it does have a unique and thoughtful 2D and three-dimensional uh, shape. So now that we have a better understanding of nature's two and 3D anatomy of the mitral valve, what are the ideal leaflets to maximize inflow and closure? And I think the answer to this is really a trapdoor design. So here you have um, the schematic of the left ventricle, the aortic valve in place. You have a 2D place where the mitral valve sits, but then how do you design something to actually uh, open and close? And I think the answer to that is you really need uh, in nature's uh, design, uh, in nature's pretty smart, is that you need a trapdoor design. So what nature did was she put a mitral valve that's fixed to the anterior mitral annulus that then kind of flaps into the left ventricular outflow tract. And, and what this does is actually pretty unique and, and very thoughtfully done. What this does, it allows the anterior mitral leaflet to completely get out of the way during diastolic filling. And, and you want it to, because you want 
as big of an orifice as possible without any obstruction. And the posterior anus, you know, it, it, nature couldn't do this big flap on the posterior anus because uh, just in nature and in the, in the anatomy of the, the posterior anus, uh, it wouldn't work. But also, it actually would increase the risk of, uh, of SAM. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. But also, what's unique about putting this big trap door and why the, the anterior mitral leaflet is two thirds larger than the posterior leaflet is then it allows the mitral valve to close posteriorly. And again, you can't build a trap door uh, with it attached to the posterior mitral leaflet because you risk uh, of SAM. Uh, what really is neat uh, and, and kind of made me think about it a little bit is, is with this concept is that with this trap door idea, what it does is it allows blood to be baffled into the left ventricle during diastole, as you can see here. So when the door is open, the blood is being, that, that little you know, trap door anterior leaflet baffles the blood posteriorly into the left ventricle. And then when the door closes, as you can see here, now the mitral valve is closed, then it directs the blood towards the left ventricular outflow tract. I, my drawings aren't the best. I, I, I probably need someone to help me draw those, but, but hopefully you understand the concept a little bit, which is really fascinating because now you have a structure that um, can very efficiently open wide during diastole, effectively close, but also direct the blood where it should go, uh, which I think is uh, pretty fascinating. So here's a, a, a video that might help you understand the baffling concept a little bit. So the mitral valve opens, uh, the blood is directed posteriorly. Again, the papillary muscle on goes down a little bit is posteriorly because of that. And, uh, and then as the mitral valve closes, it helps because of the shape of the mitral valve, uh, anterior mitral leaflet mainly, it baffles the blood into the left ventricular outflow tract and why, that's why it's so important. So now that uh, we have um, uh, the 2D, 3D, and kind of the leaflet structures developed, how do you anchor the leaflets uh, in itself? And of course, we know they're through cords and, and through papillary muscles. But, but I think it's a little bit oversimplified. And it wasn't until we kind of, until I started exploring a little bit, I realized that the cords and papillary muscles are very, very strategically placed. Um, the the, the papillary muscles are, are really often at the middle of the coaptation line, and they're grabbing on to both the anterior and the posterior mitral leaflet in one. And, and oftentimes, as many surgeons know, it's not just one papillary muscle, it's usually kind of almost a cascade of mountains. You have a big papillary muscle, an anterior and posterior papillary muscle, you have smaller ones. But the important thing is that they do grab in parallel the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. It's not just one papillary muscle grabbing onto the posterior leaflet, and one papillary muscle grabbing onto the anterior leaflet. And it's again, very, very strategically placed. So um, they, again, the, the papillary muscle anchor both the anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet. Um, when you look next time you're in the operating room and you look at the papillary muscles and you can see this picture here, it makes sense that the posterior, the, the papillary muscles are positioned relatively posteriorly. And the reason why it does, it, it's, it's so that it can facilitate a posterior closure uh, uh, during, uh, during diastole, uh, during systole. Uh, and, and the, um, uh, and, and what the, the way the papillary muscles are, are positioned, I'm not sure if you see my, my cursor right here and here, that completely makes sense as well, because what it also does is it creates a nice runway for the blood for the, into the left ventricular outflow tract. You know, if you ever have a surgeon or anyone draw the papillary muscle in this location and in this location, you should probably just walk out of the room because nature wouldn't do that. It wouldn't make sense for for nature to build a mountain range in the middle of the left ventricular outflow tract where the blood is going to be shuttling through. And from a, a, even a surgical standpoint, these are the boundaries when you do a septomyectomy. If you're doing a, a septomyectomy, usually your guardrails are the, uh, the papillary muscles, and that's where uh, you try to uh, increase uh, the left ventricular outflow tract. So, uh, so again, uh, something simple as just you know, cords and papillary muscles had a lot of thought and design uh, placed into them. This is, I think, the, probably the most important problem um, in, that I wanted to try to explain, um, and hopefully um, we'll do an adequate job uh, in doing so. But ultimately, um, how does a mitral valve close? Um, and uh, uh, you have to remember that ultimately the mitral valve is a high pressure closing valve. Uh, the pressure cycles zero to 120 millimeters of mercury uh, throughout your cardiac cycle. It opens and closes three billion times throughout your entire life. And, and for the surgeons and, and anatomists out there, you'll realize that the mitral valve is, is paper thin. The thickness is uh, roughly 
uh, millimeters. So how does the mitral valve close uh, and effectively close throughout the cardiac cycle? That's a lot of pressure for one valve. And the reality is there's no other valve that have this, has this level of responsibility. If you think about even the aortic valve, when the aortic valve closes, it needs to close during kind of diastolic pressure, which is very different than a systolic pressure. And, and, um, and there's really, again, you know, uh, once you dive in uh, to uh, the mitral valve, you, you, you begin, I began to really appreciate how simply complex the mitral valve is. Um, you know, analogy that, that I have always used in the past, and, and maybe some of you as well, is describe uh, to patients uh, the mitral valve like it was a parachute, but I think that's all wrong. For one, if you look at this picture, uh, our leaflets don't billow like a parachute, uh, as you can see here, uh, unless there's something wrong, unless you have myxomatous disease or Barlow's disease. And then also, if you measure the tension of our cords during systole, it's almost near zero. But on the other hand, in a parachute, it's going down. That tension is really high. So, so again, the, you know, oftentimes you use an analogy of parachute, and I think it's a little bit of a dangerous analogy uh, to use. And I, I don't think it's an actual, actual, actually accurate analogy. So how does a mitral valve close? Um, and, um, and hopefully I'll be able to explain this through this series of slides. Uh, the answer really relies on physics and cooptation. So here we have the mitral valve during systole. And at any point during, this, during systole, there's a surface area, as you can see here, uh, that eventually needs to be closed. Uh, and this surface area is measured in square inches. There's also a pressure acting on this surface area during systole in pounds per square inch. So at any point in that systole, you can calculate the pounds of force that's trying to really blow up this valve and blow the mitral valve open at some point. Again, that's a strong, strong force. So in theory, the only thing that we then need to know to try to figure out how the mitral valve closes, what's the opposite and opposing force that keeps the valve closed. It turns out that when you compress a liquid inside a cylinder, the pressure, act, the pressure acting on any point inside is the same in all directions. We know this, we all took uh, 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 physics. So the pressure here is the same as pressure here as the pressure here. So you can imagine then as the leaflets come together, there's a 2P pressure acting on both sides of the coaptation that squeezes the mitral leaflets together during systole. And this 2P has, by definition, to be very, very strong to lock, lock the mitral valve together and keep that mitral valve closed uh, throughout the cardiac cycle. Um, this is a really important concept, uh, and I, I hope you understand it, but I hope, hope we now appreciate something that we probably take for granted. How does a mitral valve so effectively close three billion times throughout the cardiac cycle be able to withstand uh, a huge uh, spectrum of pressure gradients uh, and be able to open with, with such big diastolic filling throughout the cardiac cycle. Here's a, hopefully a, another schematic that will, that will explain it a little bit better. So during coaptation, uh, during systole, the leaflets are together uh, and that pressure, that force is what keeps the leaflets closed. Uh, it's really important, again, I, uh, to understand that, that during systole, the cords have relatively minimal tension during closure. It's unlike a parachute. Uh, analogy that I, I falsely would often uh, uh, describe to my patients. And what I think that the cords ultimately do is that the cords help position the leaflets to maximize coaptation. They're almost, it's like a frame that will help position the leaflets so that when that force comes together, it snaps together and then, and then, and then facilitates coaptation. And that's why as surgeons, we know, and, and Dr. David really taught us this and, and many others, that's why the coaptation depth is so important to predict durable repair. After we do surgery, there are a lot of different tests we could do, an ink test or whatever. But, but then you, I always ask anesthesia, hey, let, let's look at the echo and please measure the coaptation depth. And we know that often the coaptation depth of greater than a centimeter will predict the durable repair. But what's also fascinating is every time in the operating room, I did a couple of cases yesterday, I'm doing another mitral valve repair today. And, and most likely I'll end up putting cords uh, and, and I, and I always tell my, the, the medical students or the fellows, like, listen, this patient here is 60 or 70 or whatever years old. He or she is developing heart failure. It very, it's very symptomatic. And ultimately, we fix this patient by just a couple, two or three neocords, neocords that fix this patient. But there's no way this 5-0 Gore-Tex cord can hold the mitral valve like a parachute throughout the cardiac cycle. So which is fascinating because we're, we're fixing this valvular pathology 
with 5 vortex. Ultimately, that's what does it. And there's and, and there's that cord in itself can't hold the force required to keep that much valve closed throughout the cardiac cycle. Well, something else is also unique too is that sometimes on occasion we'll do an alfieri stitch to uh, to to reapproximate the leaflets. And again, you know, whatever size suture you want to use, do an alfieri stitch. For those who uh, aren't cardiothoracic surgeons, an alfieri stitch is made by alfieri. And essentially, it's a suture that reapproximates the anterior and the posterior mitral leaflet to facilitate co-optation. But the point is that usually this stitch is like a 4-0 or you know maybe 5-0 suture, and there's no way this 4-0 or 5-0 suture is holding that leaflet closed throughout the cardiac cycle. But what it does do is it helps reapproximate the correct position of the leaflet so that when that pressure hits, it helps slap the leaflet together and it locks in and it gets closed. The last thing that I think is really fascinating is and, and, um, and interesting is that this force is auto-regulating. So, so the higher the pressure, let's say if you're running after uh, prey or running away from predators, that force pushing the leaflet shut actually will get stronger and that force is actually a higher force. The last concept I want to, um, or problem I want to uh, try to address is what's the timing of mitral valve closure? And, and, and this is a little bit of a quiz to kind of remind us of, uh, of medical school a little bit. You remember that S1 and S2 are the very sounds uh, of, uh, of the heart when you, when you uh, uh, pull out your stethoscope. Well, the very first sound, the lub-dub, is many of you know, the first sound, S1, is the closure of the mitral and tricuspid valve, and that's meaningful. And the second heart sound is the closure of the aortic and pulmonary valve. So, so that, that helps answer uh, uh, the, that question. It's funny, I was in the OR recently, and I was quizzing our students, like, well, what is you know, S1 stand for it, and which valve closes first? Well, you know, they're accurately say they're here. She was actually accurately able to say S1 was a mitral valve, but then kind of stumble a little bit about which valve closed first. But but you have to have the mitral valve closed first. One, it's S1. They wouldn't name it S1 if it didn't close first. But you have to have it closed first because if the mitral valve was open during systole, then there would be regurgitation. So the mitral valve has to close fractions of a second before the aortic valve opens. And I think that timing is, is, uh, is important. Uh, I'm gonna spend uh, the rest of my time changing gears a little bit and, and try to kind of relay how anatomy relates to uh, us as, as surgeons and, and particularly cardiac surgeons and how anatomy is, is so important. And the first thing I hit to that earlier was this concept of SAM in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And this picture here, um, you see uh, a cross section of the left ventricle. You see the anterior mitral leaflet here, the posterior leaflet here. Again, the, the, the palpable muscles are very posterior. SAM, systolic anterior leaflet motion, happens usually when that coaptation line right here gets pushed uh, uh, anteriorly here. And, and, and again, that's why the papillary muscle is so important to have a posterior papillary muscle. And that's why if you think about the risk factors for SAM, or if you put too small of a ring in right here, and you can imagine too small of a ring helps, it pushes the co-optation line here, or you have a lot of myxomous tissue where this posterior leaflet is larger than it kind of pushes it, the, the leaflet, uh, the anterior leaflet uh, towards le the left ventricular alpha tract. Or let's say if you have hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy where instead of the septum being kind of thin like this, let's say the septum had a huge bulge here like that, then you can imagine when this anterior leaflet flops during here, during, um, uh, uh, during diastolic filling, eventually tries to close during systole, it can get in the way of the left ventricular outflow tract. One concept I, I, I think it's, is unique and, and, and interesting to point out that is that in those who do a lot of septomyectomies, I think it's important from a physiologic standpoint, the left ventricular outflow tract really starts at the tip of the anterior mitral leaflet, uh, not necessarily at the body, uh, of the uh, of the septum or the body of, of the left ventricular uh, left ventricular outflow tract per se, the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction when you have it will often start at the tip of the leaflet because you can imagine if the tip of the leaflet is long and curves here, then this distance here is where you're going to start and begin to feel the obstruction. And interestingly, for those who do a lot of septomyectomies, the most common reason why septomyectomies fail is because surgeons don't adequately do a deep mid-body septomyectomy. It's easy to shave off part of the septum in the basal area, but it's a lot harder or maybe underappreciate how important it is to go deeper uh, and shave off the, um, uh, the septum. This, uh, why, why, from a clinical standpoint, why is the right chest the most 
anatomic approach to the mitral valve. And this is very dear to me because uh, I do a lot of minimally invasive uh, surgery. So I, I think if you were to step back a little bit and ask, you know, perhaps an anatomy professor, uh, what's the, the best way to approach the mitral valve? I think you need to understand a couple of important principles. Or principles. The first is that the mitral valve is a slightly vertical and posterior structure. And in this x-ray here, you see the mitral valve, this patient had a prior mitral valve repair. The ring is very posterior, as you can see here. So the mitral valve is a very vertical and posterior structure. So the most ergonomic and best approach uh, way to get to the mitral valve is actually via the right chest. Uh, and, and whether you do a small incision or a big incision, doesn't matter. You know, in the past, we would use big incisions to the right chest to get to the mitral valve. It just so happens that if you go through the chest, the right chest, you can make your incision smaller or bigger. Unfortunately, if you go through the sternum, for the most part, it has to be a relatively big sternotomy. But, but from an anatomic ergonomic standpoint, it's actually easier to visualize a mitral valve through the right chest. This is a, a, a mitral valve repair that, that we did, again, through the right chest, very small incision, very unobstructed, direct on false view of the mitral valve. Um, even in obese patients, it actually is a lot easier to see the mitral valve in obese patients on FOS because you're not looking at, you're not looking deep into the barrel chest. Uh, and, and oftentimes when I see an obese patient, I, I don't shy away at all because I feel very confident I, I can get to the mitral valve uh, for, for our, our larger patients. This, this figure here helps you understand, you know, if you were to do a stenotomy, you essentially have to go through that depth uh, uh, of length to be able to eventually see the mitral valve. And as you look down at the mitral valve, you're looking at the valve, not directly, but you then have to do all these maneuvers to kind of rotate the valve into play. Uh, and, and again, if you do a stenotomy mitral valve repair or replacement, uh, it, it's the hardest if the patient has a deep chest because eventually you, you have to rotate the mitral valve into view uh, as you can see here. So the, the top view is a mitral valve uh, repair that's being done by a sternotomy. And again, you have a little bit of a canted view of the mitral valve. The bottom view uh, is a mitral valve repair done through the right chest through a minimal invasive approach. So you can see you have a very direct, beautiful on foss view of the mitral valve. The trade-off obviously is that we need to use uh, uh, long shafted instruments uh, to do this. This is a video of, uh, of me doing a minimal invasive mitral valve repair. Um, something that I, I enjoy doing and, and we'll be doing later on this morning. Um, it doesn't necessarily take longer if you have a, a good team. Uh, we'll often do two and sometimes three cases uh, a day uh, doing the mitral valve repair. Uh, here, I'm actually testing the mitral valve with a, a laparoscopic uh, insufflator. I'll mark the area of prolapse. Again, it's amazing that you know this patient obviously had a peachy prolapse and her pathology is being fixed with these small dinky cords. And those cords are not holding the tension. Those cords are helping to position the mitral valve in the right position um, so that during systole, it can appropriately close. Here, I'm setting the, the length, uh, the height of the mitral leaflet. And then finally, we test the mitral valve. And as you can see here, it's, uh, it's competent. Um, maybe if, uh, I know that we have maybe 10 or 15 minutes left, and, and the rest are probably a little bit less important concepts. And, and maybe I'll just kind of wrap up here. But what, one thing I wanted to, to show was this video here of, um, of something that someone, uh, let me borrow this video and, and every surgeon who sees this uh, would cringe. Uh, this patient had a recent mitral valve replacement and then coming off bypass, you have this huge kind of flow of blood from the back of the heart. And, and, and when this happens, and fortunately it doesn't happen often, um, you know, it's time to call home and tell everybody that you'd be a little bit late for dinner, but essentially the patient had an AV dissociation and, and the, the anatomic, Points that I want to kind of mention with an AV dissociation is that AV dissociations often happen in the posterior mitral annulus. It often happens if you are not saving the subvalvular apparatus. It happens when there's a lot of manipulation of the valve. But the reason why is that posterior annulus is the weakest part of the annulus. That anterior annulus is connected to the, 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 the fibrous skeleton is a lot stronger. But usually if you have an AV dissociation, it happens posteriorly uh, in the mitral annulus. Um, I'll, I'll maybe consider wrapping up here because I, I, I suspect there might be some questions. Um, the rest of the talk was going to talk about TAVR and transcatheter mitral technologies, why it didn't happen, and why uh, the mitral valve is such a more complicated uh, valve pathology than the uh, aortic valve. Um, and, and then again, to wrap, wrap up, I, I do think ultimately the heart was designed for us to be able to escape predators uh, or perhaps for us to, to catch prey. The goal of the talk was to explore 
nature's design of the mitral valve with a focus on anatomy uh, to try to connect um, anatomy and clinical relevance. I'll end with this last slide. This is Kobe Bryant. Uh, and I know that in Toronto, there are a lot of avid basketball players. This is Kobe Bryant and uh, Michael Jordan. Uh, Kobe, as a child, uh, looked up to Michael Jordan. It was his hero. Uh, and, and to one day play in the NBA with Michael Jordan uh, was, was such a privilege. I'm by no means a Kobe Bryant, but I have to say from the very bottom of my heart, it, it really is humbling and, and such an honor to, uh, to be able to present among uh, all-star players at the University of Toronto uh, and share my experience and understanding the mitral valve, which may be controversial, but I share this concept with all of you. Uh, thank you. This is um, uh, uh, some pictures. The first left is uh, circa October 2021 during my four-year-old daughter's birthday. Uh, not that long ago, September 23rd, 2002, uh, we had another daughter. Uh, and, um, and then on the top right-hand corner, that's her about five months ago. And the bottom right, circa, circa about maybe 55 million years ago, is our very simply uh, but very complicated mitral valve. So again, I want to thank all of you for just really the privilege to be here. And I apologize for not having an opportunity to, to be there in person and, and share uh, some drinks and, and coffee with you all. Thank you. <laughs> Tom, thanks very much. Uh, that was an absolutely fantastic talk. I love it. Sort of marries uh, anatomy, physiology, physics, and a sort of teleologically uh, you know, a, a approach to sort of designing the mitral valve. It makes it hard to imagine that it actually could be any other way than the way that you've described. Like, so um, I'm going to sort of ask uh, the audience, and I know that there's going to be a lot of sort of you know, questions and interest here too. Um, just put your hand up and then we can sort of unmute you like you know, in, in sequence like, you know, so you can ask your questions. Alternatively, you can just uh, uh, type your question into the chat and we'll, we'll sort of monitor that as well. Um, so I'll try and get things started off by so just pointing out to our sort of broader audience that our initial mitral, certainly our replacement prostheses, forced the sort of you know, elegant sort of non-planar sort of you know, saddle ship double curved design of the mitral analysis Thomas so elegantly described into a sort of, you know, immobile, uh, flat, and completely circular position. And so, you know, it, given that it's, you know, certainly, um, you know, easy to understand why there might have been some physiological advantages, both to sort of repair techniques. So overall, like, you know, and, uh, and to sort of newer prostheses. So Tom, maybe I'll, I'll start off by asking you to sort of comment on the evolution of our prostheses over time from, uh, prosthe from uh, replacement prostheses to the uh, to repair devices as they introduced a bit of flexibility, a bit, a bit of non-planarity. Yeah, so so I think ultimately there there's sadly uh, and, and and Dr. David and, and Bobby and others, you know, please feel free to chime in. I, I don't think there's been a whole lot of progress in the technology for mitral valve repair, annuloplasty rings, or bioprosthetic uh, uh, replacements. It's it's still very fixed. I think ultimately what you do is if you put either even if it's a flexible ring or a band, and we've shown this in Craig Miller's lab, you, you freeze the annular dynamics. So you lose a lot of that 20 to 30% kind of enlargement of the annulus uh, during diastolic filling. And, and I assure you that, that a lot of these patients aren't gonna go out there and be avid marathon runners. So, I mean, they can, don't get me wrong. And we've had patients that, that do it as well, but, but it's hard to, but what we can do as surgeons, and I, and I encourage people to do is, try to maximize that area as much as possible. Don't put it in a small ring, but you wanna, and it's a balance because you wanna make sure that you put a big enough ring in uh, to, to help that inflow, but you also don't want too big of a ring because you want those leaflets to come together and kiss and snap together. So it's a little bit of a balance, but I don't think there's much, much progress. Um, uh, and I, there's not a lot of data either. You know, you know, people will debate and fight about rings to the cows go home, but there's not really good solid data which ring is better, a complete ring, a flexible ring, you know, et cetera. But I'd love, you know, thoughts from, from people more experienced than myself uh, to comment on that, that, that question as well. Thank you, Tom. Like, you know, so uh, Subod, like, you know, uh, who's uh, one of our faculty, search, you, know, you, you know Subod already, like, uh, I think Mike's uh, just commented in the chat, like, what a wonderful presentation. Thank you. My reason why anatomically, the P2 segment is the one that elongates and ruptures most often. So can you comment about P2? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I don't actually don't know that answer. Uh, uh, why, that's a, that's a great question. I don't know why P2 
most of the time, if you have a prolapse, it's usually in P2. Usually if you have a flail, it's often in the, the in that, you know, rupture of the, the P2 cords. Uh, I, I, I actually don't know that answer. Um, Thanks, that Sean. is a good question. Yeah. And then I think just a reflection of how little we know about, you know, some pathology. I just wanted to say a big thank you. It was such a wonderful presentation and uh, very inspiring. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Um, Jason, I'm going to get you to just unmute uh, people over their hands up. Um, I, I Can I jump in, Terry? Yes, please. A quick question. Hi. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful talk, uh, Tom. Um, I don't do many mitral repairs, to be quite honest. We have two extraordinary mitral surgeons, but sometimes I get a complex Barlow's and we'll put, I'll do an Alfieri with a ring and it seems almost like cheating. Like it's so mm -hmm. simple. And, you know, I'm moving towards that. Like, it, it should there are there any caveats there? Um, is something I should be wary about? It seems almost too easy to do. And how much, I guess, how much Alfieri are you doing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, and, I, and I struggle with that as well. Um, it seems like it's cheating. It seems like it's not anatomic. But I think the data shows otherwise. Uh, I, there is some reasonable data that was presented at AHS uh, maybe eight, nine years ago or so, that showed long-term data uh, comparing alfieri stitch uh, versus kind of the, the resection uh, approach used for, for kind of Barlow's, myxomatous disease. And the durability was actually fairly comparable. And I think the reason why, as, as, as I kind of alluded to, is that what the alfieri does is it helps set those leaflets so that they come together into that right position so that during systole, it kind of slaps together. Because that stitch in itself is not holding the pressure, but what it is doing is help setting up the stage for that to happen. And, and most of the time, the patients who have the myxomas and valves, they actually have a, a large annulus. You can get away with putting uh, an alfieri stitch and you don't run the, the risk of, um, of mitral stenosis. I'll also add, and we, we might not like to hear this, but, but maybe because of that concept, mitral clip might be not as bad as we think, right? And and you know we were you know it's easy for us to kind of poo-poo mitral clip, but but the data is actually other than the fact that you know it has a higher regurgitation rate, but but you know it, I think what it does it helps kind of set those leaflets together so that during systole it comes together, and I think that's the most important thing that that we do. That's what cords do; they kind of set up the stage. I think the alfieri stitch uh, helps set up that stage. How often I do it? I actually found myself to do it you know more frequently. Um, uh, just to kind of make sure I have a perfect repair. Sometimes I'll, I'll put cords in and it's like a little bit of a sliver or something. I, I just want to make sure that there's like zero molecule, you know, red blood cell molecules that goes in left atrium and I'll just kind of put a little stitch in. Uh, and, and so far it's worked, worked pretty well. Yeah. Thanks. Burroughs? Hi, Tom. That was absolutely excellent. Um, how, knowing anatomy and physiology, I think it's uh, the cornerstone for doing good surgery. Uh, my question to you was keeping with the same point about the 2P force that you're talking about. Um, wouldn't you think that maintaining <coughs> the mobility <coughs> of the posterior mitral leaflet while repairing the valve would probably improve the duration of or durability of your repair? Because that would probably help in maintaining that 2P force and less tension on the neopause that you are going to make. So coming to that point, do you think that a resection technique, which obviously has also produced excellent results so far, but it usually makes the posterior leaflet pretty stiff and uh, you know doesn't move. Whereas with the neopause, you have the opportunity of maintaining the mobility of the posterior leaflet. Do you think that makes would make a difference uh, about the long-term durability, especially in young patients where you're looking at another 40 years, you know, of life. Yeah, Prusa, maybe I'll, I'll start, before I answer that question, I'll ask you a quick question. Do you know who published the first neoports, the concept? Uh, experimentally, I think it was Freighter, right? Freighter, but Dr. David was one of the first ones. That, that actually, I know. Yeah, Clinically, yeah. Dr. David, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But so to answer, I, I have this huge talk on respect versus respect techniques, and, and I'm a big respecter. Uh, for, for those who uh, aren't um, surgeons, you know, to fix a posterior leaflet, there are really kind of two broad ways. One, you can resect the posterior leaflet in different ways uh, to address the prolapse, or the and they call it the resection technique that's kind of been 
kind of spearhead of our Carpentier and 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 really kind of the, the start of repair techniques. Uh, and then then the the respect technique where you respect the anatomy uh, and you just put cords in. My bias, and I have a, a big talk on this, is that I feel that if the pathology is uh, in a ruptured cord, then to me, intuitively, it doesn't make sense why are we resecting leaflets, assuming you don't have a whole lot of redundant leaflets. That's, that's one kind. So I, that's why I always choose respect techniques. And I always talk that, you know, we, we know that we don't do enough repairs, but if you were to learn and to be a good repair surgeon, you need a lot of different tools in your toolbox. But if you were to learn one technique that's going to work for everything, for most things, then neocords will address that. For example, if you have anterior leaflet prolapse, well, you can't resect. If you have anterior leaflet prolapse, if you have commissural or P3 prolapse, you can't. Or if you have bi leaflet prolapse, usually you need some coral technique. So that's why I think, you know, if, you, if you're able to um, uh, learn respect techniques, it's more applicable throughout the pathology uh, of valvular uh, uh, mitral valve disease. So to answer your question regarding uh, uh, kind of freezing the posterior leaflet, you're exactly right. And that's why for me, I do respecting these because when you resect, and if you look at an echo and someone who does a, a resection, that posterior leaflet is completely frozen. But we also know this, the data shows that people who do resection techniques, they often put a smaller aneoplasty ring, right? And, and, and again, you know, this concept of just widening that, that inflow to make sure blood can come in as much as possible. You know, there, there haven't been good, Kind of studies that compare respect versus respect as far as kind of functional capacity for patients, but intuitively to me, intuitively to me, it doesn't make as much sense that you're end up ending up having to shrink the mitral annulus. And it makes sense, right? You, you have to shrink the annulus. If you if you're uh, pushing leaflets here and you're just whipping it over here and you're freezing it, well, you can have to bring this together closer somehow. So you have, you can do that with a smaller annulus versus if you just do cords, you can leave it as is and they can still kind of come together in, in case. That's my bias. Uh, I'm a I'm a huge respecter. On rare occasions, I will resect. All right. Next up, we have uh, Viv, and then we've got a question in the Q and A panel from Danielle. And after that, I'm going to ask Sir Tyrone to sort of you know, uh, give us his comments. Viv, yeah, thank you, and, and Tom, uh, great to see you again, and uh, a fantastic lecture. And I have to say, of all the Harlan Smith lectures I've heard over the years you really paid honor to the, the tradition of the anatomy and physiological background of this talk. So um, congratulations to you. Um, one aspect that you didn't really touch on, which was important many, many years ago, was the contribution of the mitral annulus to LV function. And I, and I actually spent some time in Craig Miller's lab, and, and that's when he taught me that the mitral valve contributes to LV function. No one ever thought it did. And, and there's where some of the, the controversy about flexible versus rigid stents came on. And it actually, we showed it in our stentless valves. And I know stentless aortic valves are sort of passe now, but one of the reasons why we think the stentless valves, although their durability wasn't that much different, had better survival was because you preserved LV function. Because with removing that rigid um, aortomitral junction allowed the mitral valve to contribute to systolic function. So you wanna comment a little bit on what you've learned about the mitral valve's contribution to LV function? Yeah, and you're, you're exactly right. Thanks, Vivek. Uh, and um, we could probably sit down one day and, and share kind of stories of being Craig Wheeler's lab in the back cave and, you know, the emails at two or three in the morning. But, um, but you're exactly right. I think people often forget that the, both the aortic valve and the mitral valve are dynamic structures that's not static and not a closed door that just opens and closed. And we use that analogy a lot for, for the patients, but, but the, it's very dynamic and, and purposely so. To improve LV function. And, and one of the things I alluded to is that throughout the cardiac cycle, the annulus does change shape. That saddle shape actually will straighten out, will get larger to really help the inflow of the blood flow into the LV. And through Starling's law, we know that you know the higher the, the stretch of the sarcomeres, well, you know, guess what happens? There's higher contractility. So so intuitively, it also makes sense that if you're helping facilitate that inflow through such a short amount of time by dynamically changing shape, gulping in the, 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 the blood as uh, you have in filling, you are going to uh, uh, help uh, improve the contractility um, throughout the cardiac cycle. But uh, thank you for sharing your experience as well. And uh, then we've got a question from Danielle Bonneau. Like, you know, resection of P2 without addition of Cordy, as suggested by Mike Borger, pro or con? 
I'm sorry, what was that question again, Dr. Yeah. Resection of P2 without addition of CORD, as uh, suggested by Mike Borger, pro or con? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little con you know, with the same idea that if, if I feel that if the pathology is a ruptured cord intuitively, it doesn't make sense to me to resect uh, something that's not broken and to fix those cords uh, would be just to put new cords in, uh, and and it seems to work. Uh, and and as I alluded to earlier, you know, there's a lot of data to suggest that when you do resection techniques, you end up putting a little bit of a smaller ring. Um, and and the last argument is that you know if you are an avid resector, then you have to develop another add another tool in your toolbox, which are cords, and that that's why mitral valve repair can be so complicated. And and you know, I have another kind of talk that I, I think that mitral valve repair shouldn't be as complicated and, and is easy, but in some ways we make it complicated by just doing a lot of different fancy stuff to it. But I think if you just learn one technique, you, you do it well, it'll work 90% of the time. Uh, and and that's um, that's usually good enough for, for most of our primary mitral regurgitation patients. Thank you. Uh, I remember you know, in this discussion of sort of flexible versus rigid, you know, Tyrone teaching me as a resident many years ago about you know what happens to the supposedly flexible rings like within a matter of a couple of months like so so this has been a fantastic Q&A session I think yeah, maybe a great way to close it out would be to ask Tyrone to sort of give us his uh, thoughts uh, on what has been a very provocative uh, perfectly anatomically suited um, you know uh, Harlan Smith lecture um, and uh, and Q&A session Tyrone what what do you think uh, thanks Tom for uh, being our I guess speaker uh, I I learn very early in my career, actually as a medical student, if you want to be a surgeon, you better be an anatomist. But then on the second year, you learn about physiology as well. You have to believe that uh, we are built the way we are to fulfill a function. So functional anatomy is likely more pertinent than just anatomy. If you happen to be a like one in four, one in five human beings who inherit a genetic abnormality where it connects tissue abnormal in the heart, the likelihood of your P2 to prolapse is very high. And it prolapses because of functional anatomy. If you take a look at P2, it's a relative short segment anchored by two very different papillary muscles. Half of it is anchored by the anterior papillary muscle functioning very long, very elastic. The other half is anchored by the posterior wall of the heart, or the posterior upper muscle, which doesn't move, stubby. So the poor P2, which has a genetic abnormality, is subject to two different forces. Well, it breaks as you live longer and longer. So that's why P2 is the most commonly affected segment. Then, the medial half of the mitral valve, again, because the medial half of the mitral valve is anchored by the posterior papillary muscle, very different than the anterior papillary muscle. That's for the question that came along. Uh, we don't have a, a proper aneloplasty ring. There are 48 available commercially, 48. Every surgeon has their own because none of them is right, none of them is wrong. And finally, for surgeons that repair mitral valve, you don't repair mitral valve to get away from mitral regurgitation in the operate room. I heard some of the uh, questions. Can I put a, a Gore-Tex here? Can I do an Alfieri there? These are bail-out techniques. If you repair a mitral valve, you should repair thinking that that's the last operation the patient is going to have for the mitral valve. In other words, do a repair that's going to last the patient's lifetime, not only the perioperative period. The moment you start putting this in your head, you're going to find that your techniques have to be adapted to the pathology rather than to your needs to correct regurgitation in the operating room. We have now 30 years follow-up. I have personal. 30 years follow-up of uh, mitral valve repair in some 3,000 patients. 95% of them, they repair for life. 5% failed. Failed 
because I did an imperfect repair. Repair should be for life, not to fix the uh, regurgitation in the operating room. Thank you again, Tom, for coming and, uh, uh, and stressing the importance of a functional anatomy. Why Thank you, Dr. David, for your wisdom. Sir, go ahead, Tom. Uh, I, was, I was thanking Dr. David for his wisdom. So, so yeah, that's that's a great way to kind of close things out. Like, you know, Tom, I want to thank you again for uh, for giving us actually a really wonderful Harlan Smith lecture. I must say, you know, it's uh, it's uh, you know, and it's sort of inspiration to sort of you know uh, renew our interest in anatomy. Sort of point out to all our learners, like you know, the critical aspects of really paying attention to something that uh, that you know, if you're if you don't know in first year of medical school that you want to be a surgeon. That uh, that you may kind of skim over, but but it perfectly encapsulates how an understanding of these kind of fundamental sciences that you know underlie surgery is key to sort of you know success in a in a sort of you know outstanding clinical career. So Tom, thank you so much for coming up, giving us a truly wonderful Harlan Smith lecture on behalf of uh, the Division of Anatomy, Cardiovascular Surgery, and the Department of Surgery. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in person at uh, at a meeting soon. And my yeah. so conclave. <laughs> See you soon. Thank you. Fantastic. See you soon, Tom. Thanks so Thanks, much. Thanks, Merle. Nice seeing you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Jason. Have a good day. Yeah, you too.